Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Thursday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives today, as usual. And, Jim, our good martini comes courtesy of this announcement from U.S. Army Colonel Daniel King yesterday at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. The U.S. Army Forces Command has thoroughly reviewed the Army's investigation surrounding Sergeant Robert Beaudry Bergdahl's 2009 disappearance in Afghanistan and formally charged Sergeant Bergdahl under the Armed Forces Uniform Code of Military Justice on March 25, 2015, with desertion, with intent to shirk important or hazardous duty and misbehavior before the enemy by endangering the safety of a command, unit, or place and has referred the case to an Article 32 preliminary hearing. So, Jim, this is obviously an issue we talked about a lot last year. You always want to get back uh, your personnel, even under very difficult circumstances, such as was suspected and now apparently confirmed here with the desertion of Bo Bergdahl. But the handover of the five key Taliban figures in exchange uh, is really grating now that we have even more confirmation of what we thought was true. Yeah, and and people might wonder, why is this the good martini? Well, (laughs) clearly, this is an issue the administration would much rather have go away. Uh, They they had their lovely Rose Garden ceremony. They thought they wanted to imply that this was a massive success and a great symbol of the winding down of our effort in Afghanistan. As we now know, it was nothing of the sort. And in fact, a lot of people have said, oh, my goodness, we gave up five uh, Taliban, uh, apparently several of which have already contacted their former colleagues in violation of the agreement. And, and, you know, intelligence indicates that at least four of them are expected to return to the fight when their uh, restricted exile ends in this coming June. But in addition, there were six uh, U.S. soldiers who were killed looking for Bo Bergdahl. And so I think there are some people who would say, no, this wasn't a five for one deal. This was an 11 for one deal. Uh, it was an astonishingly bad deal. And it's kind of fascinating. I, I you know, wrote in the morning jolt today about how Hillary Clinton had insisted, well, it makes absolutely no difference how you end up being a, a prisoner of war. Really? Really doesn't matter at all? You know, th- th- there seems to be this insistence that, uh, as you had said, we, actually, we always want to see all of our troops come home in one piece. But I, 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 I don't think it's unreasonable to say we see a prisoner of war who's captured on the battlefield differently than we see someone who deserts. And, and the idea that, you know, it's unreasonable for military leaders to take that into calculation when making the cost benefit, uh, risk versus reward analysis of a rescue effort or other things like that, uh, that just strikes me as, as just bizarre. That wouldn't affect your thinking in some way. So this is clearly an issue the administration wanted to just disappear. It would be much easier for them if he ended up being uh, not, uh, not brought up on these charges, if they just looked at the evidence and said, ah, it's inconclusive, who can tell? Hasn't he suffered enough? And uh, so I think it's a very good thing this is going forward. And we'll just kind of have a sense of actually getting a full accounting of this. And instead of this kind of, you know, uh, this, this, you know, life and death situation that was kind of used as a uh, political prop by the administration, uh, the American people will get the full story that they're entitled to. Yeah, and uh, credit to the Army here, as, as you've already said, uh, for going forward with the charges, because given the uh, the imagery of uh, the Rose Garden with uh, Bergdahl's parents and uh, what you have to would think would be quite a bit of pressure on the military not to uh, perhaps go with the most serious charge, they did it anyway. And uh, so now the administration is still saying they did the right thing. And uh, here's Jen Psaki, I think on her last day as the State Department spokeswoman, she was talking with Megyn Kelly, and she still says it was a great deal because we got Bergdahl back. And just because, you know, those five guys look like they're all set to go back to the battlefield. Don't worry about that because... We have the ability to track and work with the cutteries. The reason that we know that individuals uh, reportedly were online uh, and engaging with individuals they shouldn't be is because we track it. It means the system of tracking works. And so they're, they're horrible people, uh, Jim, and they obviously wouldn't be uh, any threat to us if they were still at Gitmo, but we're tracking them. Two months from now we won't be, but, uh, you know, all is <laughs> yeah. well. Boy, I hope that NSA program is working wonders. All right, you know, earn your pay these guys. You know, right now, guys. All right, get a lot of controversy over that. Now, again, if, if these guys, you know, go meet with Mullah Omar or somebody, and from that we end up uh, getting useful intelligence, well, maybe you know, maybe this ended up being a much better idea than it seemed at the time. But for now, 
it certainly looks like we're letting the worst of the worst walk free in exchange to get a deserter, and that's not sitting well with a lot of people. Probably too many episodes of 24, but hopefully we injected them with one of those homing things, so we, uh, yeah. we know where they well, are. I was hoping it's 24, Greg, but getting the real Homeland vibe from all this. <laughs> All right, on to the bad martini, as if the good one wasn't bad enough. Um, well, we all have been paying attention to some extent to this German Wings flight from Barcelona to Dusseldorf that went down over the weekend, 150 people dead. Uh, the story really got ominous in terms of how this happened last night when it was determined that the pilot was locked out of the cockpit by the co-pilot, and from there it didn't come as too much of a surprise this morning when we learned from prosecutors in France that it looks like the co-pilot deliberately uh, went into a nosedive and smashed this plane into the Alps into a million pieces, killing, again, all 150 people aboard. Right now, there's no specific evidence that there's a terrorist connection. But, Jim, to know that this was a deliberate murder of 150 innocent people uh, makes this a far worse story than had there just been a mechanical failure somehow. I don't know if you realized, uh, Greg, but uh, Ron Fournier of National Journal has been appointed the cop of Twitter, uh, <laughs> who will police us for appropriate expressions of, uh, uh, in circumstance, uh, really in all circumstances. His his uh, his scope of his authority knows no bounds, <laughs> and he had decreed that I had made uh, snarky remarks too soon in this set of circumstances. I believe my snarky remark was, had the co-pilot been through any recent religious experiences or spiritual conversions? At this point, as at the point of this taping, we don't know what motivated him to do this. But this was an act of mass murder. Like, and I believe it was the, the president of Lufthansa has been insisting to people, please stop calling this a suicide. If you want to commit suicide, you jump off a building, you shoot yourself, you slit your wrist. Like, there are a lot of ways to kill yourself that don't involve killing 149 other people with you. Again, is it, you know, do we know that this is Islamist terror? No. Uh, at this point, we know that the name of the pilot, we know he's a German citizen, and nothing has been uncovered yet. Having said that, I don't think it's unreasonable when you hear about someone intentionally crashing a jetliner full of innocent people to think about 9-11 and to wonder if this was connected to Islamist terror. Again, we don't know this, but I, I, the idea that, you know, oh, heaven forbid you think of that, we're going to wrap you on the knuckles over it, strikes me as rather ridiculous. I think it's, I think it's um, just as it's silly to rule anything in right now, I think it's rather silly to rule anything out. And it's kind of interesting, you know, back in 19, uh, the late 1990s, Egypt Air Flight 990, was believed to be a pilot suicide. Um, that was a, a the investigation on that one was terribly uh, handled because of a lot of contentious issues between the U.S. government and the Egyptian government. I think a lot of people would say something like that looks very different after an event like 9/11, when a pilot decides to cra you know cra intentionally crash his plane into the sea in that set of circumstances. Look, it could be some other personal issue that he was working with or something like that. Uh, somebody had pointed out to me that if you are a Islamist terrorist and your intent is to do something uh, terrorism related, um, there are much more damaging things you can do besides crashing it into a mountain. So we don't know this, but certainly anytime there is something that involves one person's actions that ends up killing a lot of innocent people, uh, it sends a chill down our spine, and it really ought to because uh, you know apparently no one saw this coming. Yeah, and I think you can still chalk it up as terrorism. It might not be Islamist terrorism. It might not mm. be part of any larger movement, but to do what he did uh, it certainly falls under the category of terrorism. All right, on to the crazy martini now, Jim. And obviously it's been a rough few weeks here for Hillary Clinton, but coming to the rescue is the HRC, Hillary Rodham Clinton, Super Volunteers. It almost sounds like a uh, group of animated uh, superheroes out there trying to protect her White House bid. And Maybe they are. Uh, but they have now decided that there are 12 words that you cannot say when covering the Hillary Clinton for president campaign because they will be watching, reading, listening, and protesting coded sexism, they have said to the New York Times. Here are the sexist words, Jim. Polarizing, calculating, disingenuous, insincere, ambitious, inevitable, <laughs> entitled, overconfident, secretive. Will do anything to win. That's actually more than one word. Represents <laughs> represents the past and out of touch. So basically, any accurate adjective for Hillary Clinton is off limits here. We will learn a lot from how the New York Times responds to this. Um, I believe the proper response to a group like that decreeing, uh, apparently, apparently trying to seize the authority of Ron Fournier <laughs> about the discourse <laughs> cop. Um, that you know, if someone says, "Here are twelve critical terms that I will that if you use them in your writing, we will we will declare you sexist." 
you are not to be listened to and you must be sent to the re-education camps and all that kind of stuff. Something like that warrants a response of a seven-page fax. <laughs> the first page is a le giant letter F. The second page is a giant letter U. And you can get the idea of where the rest of it's going. Um, like, who the hell are these people to decree? You're not allowed to use those words. As you pointed out, one, lots of them are accurate. <laughs> Okay, and then the fact that there's 12, all right, you know, like we're, we're going to cover every base of anything you could say critical. And then the third item is to say, well, if you do, it's actually being sexist. Never mind, Greg, I, you know, we don't have time to go through the archives, but I'll bet you and I have used all of those terms or a good chunk of those terms in reference to Joe Biden, in reference to President Obama, in reference to uh, any one of the Democratic senators who were tossed out on their keister in the midterm elections, right? There are a lot of old, tired, symbolizing the past. Ar what, what are the other words there? Disingenuous, calculating. Oh, we called all of them disingenuous. Go ahead, yes. <laughs> Entitled, inevitable, yeah. ambitious. Who's going to yeah. run for president that's not ambitious? Insincere. Yeah. yeah. Overconfident, secretive. Yeah. We'll do, we'll do anything to win, obviously. Yeah. Uh, represents the past and out of touch. Yeah, all of those have thrown at all kinds of them because they're good critical terms. And oh, by the way, they happen to be accurate. The notion of coded sexism. Greg, remember when sexism was, you know, women are stupid, you know, or, or women can't do those kinds of jobs or, ah, you know, those crazy women. Like, that was sexism. You know why? Because you were making a comment about an entire gender and saying that they were inferior. And that's why everybody objected to it. To say Hillary Clinton will do anything to win, there's nothing sexist about that. The idea of, well, you wouldn't say that, but yes, we would. We've done it many times. The, the left has this tendency to, um, they have King Midas in reverse. Uh, they, you know, everything they, they touch turns to something bad. <laughs> and they, they kind of have this insistence, like by, by decreeing that any criticism of Hillary Clinton is sexist, they will end up dismissing any criticism and everyone will roll their eyes. And, dismiss. and I, I would argue that there are times, particularly looking back at that 2008 campaign, and perhaps even in this coming year, where there actually will be sexist criticisms of Hillary Clinton. I'm thinking back to 2008, John Aravosis, who runs the uh, liberal blog, America blog, um, really liked Barack Obama and really didn't like Hillary Clinton. And every single time Hillary Clinton did something he, that irked him, he would put up lots of pictures of Monica Lewinsky, little heads of Monica Lewinsky with her mouth open. And it just struck me as a totally classless, I just didn't understand how the Lewinsky scandal was supposed to make you feel worse about Hillary. I, I just didn't get it. And I objected to it. And John Aravosis and I, who had been, I'd say, cordial terms uh, before then, he didn't like that. And I didn't like what he had said. And, you know, but in a rare set of circumstances, I'm willing to step up and say, wait a minute, you really shouldn't say that about Hillary Clinton, that that really is sexist or that really is inappropriate. When when this super PAC has come along and say, well, you're not allowed to use any of these words, like no one's going to care about any accusation, you know, is accusation of sexism now because it's like the boy who cried wolf. And uh, I think that's bad for our discourse, you know. But then again, I guess maybe I'm starting to sound a little bit like Ron Fournier <laughs> and uh, all the other Twitter cops. <laughs> Oh, you said but the only thing I would disagree with, Jim, is you said that if people use those words, they might be sent to re-education camps. I think it's going to be fun camps. Fun camps. That's right. <laughs> well, you know, the calisthenics would be awesome. So. <laughs> oh, speaking of fun, Jim's headed out on spring break uh, tomorrow and uh, through all of next week. You'll probably see him doing some keg stands and, and that. Oh, wait. No. <laughs> he has small children. Never mind. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but have a great time. We'll uh, see you a week from Monday. I'm looking forward to that, and I'm also looking forward to returning, Greg. So, you know, I, I, the good news is I'm sure nothing will happen in the next eight or nine days that will be, you know, good, bad, or crazy. So you just have a nice, quiet weekend. <laughs> I'm sure. Have a great time. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today, and tune in again on Friday for the next Three Martini Lunch.